The following is a conversation with Christos Goudreau, Vice President of Engineering at Google and Head of Search and Discovery at YouTube, also known as the YouTube algorithm. YouTube has approximately 1.9 billion users, and every day people watch over 1 billion hours of YouTube video. It is the second most popular search engine behind Google itself. For many people, it is not only a source of entertainment, but also how we learn new ideas from math and physics videos to podcasts to debates, opinions, ideas from out of the box thinkers and activists on some of the most tense, challenging, and impactful topics in the world today. YouTube and other content platforms receive criticism from both viewers and creators, as they should, because the engineering task before them is hard and they don't always succeed and the impact of their work is truly world-changing. To me, YouTube has been an incredible wellspring of knowledge. I've watched hundreds, if not thousands of lectures that changed the way I see many fundamentals ideas in math, science, engineering, and philosophy. But it does put a mirror to ourselves and keeps the responsibility of the steps we take in each of our online educational journeys into the hands of each of us. The YouTube algorithm has an important role in that journey of helping us find new exciting ideas to learn about. That's a difficult and an exciting problem for an artificial intelligence system. As I've said in lectures and other forums, recommendation systems will be one of the most impactful areas of AI in the 21st century. And YouTube is one of the biggest recommendation systems in the world. This is the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. If you enjoy it, subscribe on YouTube, give it five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, support it on Patreon, or simply connect with me on Twitter, Alex Friedman, spelled F-R-I-D-M-A-N. I recently started doing ads at the end of the introduction. I'll do one or two minutes after introducing the episode and never any ads in the middle that can break the flow of the conversation. I hope that works for you and doesn't hurt the listening experience. This show is presented by Cash App the number one finance app in the App Store. I personally use Cash App to send money to friends, but you can also use it to buy, sell, and deposit Bitcoin in just seconds. Cash App also has a new investing feature. You can buy fractions of a stock, say $1 worth, no matter what the stock price is. Brokerage services are provided by Cash App Investing, a subsidiary of Square and member SIPC. I'm excited to be working with Cash App to support one of my favorite organizations called FIRST best known for their first robotics and Lego competitions. They educate and inspire hundreds of thousands of students in over 110 countries and have a perfect rating on Charity Navigator, which means that donated money is used to maximum effectiveness. When you get Cash App from the App Store or Google Play and use code LEXPODCAST, you'll get $10 and Cash App will also donate $10 to FIRST, which again is an organization that I've personally seen inspire girls and boys to dream of engineering a better world. And now here's my conversation with Christos Goudreau. YouTube is the world's second most popular search engine behind Google, of course. We watch more than 1 billion hours of YouTube videos a day, more than Netflix and Facebook video combined. YouTube creators upload over 500,000 hours of video every day. The average lifespan of a human being, just for comparison, is about 700,000 hours. So what's uploaded every single day is just enough for a human to watch in a lifetime. So let me ask an absurd philosophical question. If from birth, when I was born, and there's many people born today with the internet, I watched YouTube videos nonstop. Do you think there are trajectories through YouTube video space that can maximize my average happiness or maybe education or my growth as a human being? I think there are some great trajectories through YouTube uh, videos, but I wouldn't recommend that anyone spend all of their waking hours or all of their hours watching YouTube. I mean, I think about the fact that YouTube has been really great for my kids, for instance. Uh, my oldest daughter, uh, you know, she's been watching YouTube for several years. She watches Tyler Oakley and the Vlog Brothers. She and I know that it's had a very profound and positive impact on her character. And my younger daughter, she's a ballerina and her teachers tell her that YouTube is a huge advantage for her because she can 
practice a routine and watch like professional dancers do that same routine and stop it and back it up and rewind and all that stuff, right? So it's been really good for them. And then even my son is a sophomore in college. He um, he got through his linear algebra class because of a channel called Three Blue One Brown, mm -hmm. which you know helps you understand linear algebra, but in a way that would be very hard for anyone to do on a whiteboard or a chalkboard. And so I think that those experiences, from my point of view, were very good. And, and so I can imagine really good trajectories through YouTube, yes. Have you looked at, do you think of broadly about that trajectory over a period? Because YouTube has grown up now. So over a period of years, you just kind of gave a few anecdotal examples. But, you know, I used to watch certain shows on YouTube. I don't anymore. I've moved on to other shows. I mean, ultimately, you want people to, uh, from YouTube's perspective, to stay on YouTube, to grow as human beings on YouTube. So you have to think not just what makes them engage in, in today or this month, but also over a period of years. You Absolutely. That's right. I mean, if YouTube is going to continue to enrich people's lives, then, um, you know, then it has to grow with them. And, uh, and people's interests change over time. And so I think we've, we've been working on this problem, and I'll just say it broadly as like how to inter introduce diversity and introduce people who are watching one thing to something else they might like. We've been working on that problem all the eight years I've been at YouTube. Um, it's a hard problem because, uh, I mean, of course, it's trivial to introduce diversity that doesn't help. Yeah, just right. Add I had a random video. I could just randomly select a video from the billions that we have. Uh, it's likely not to even be in your language, so <laughs> uh, the likelihood that you would watch it and develop a new interest is very, very low. And so, uh, what you want to do when you're trying to increase diversity is find something that is not too similar to the things that you've watched, but also something that you might be likely to watch. And that balance, finding that spot between those two things is quite challenging. So the so diversity of content, diversity of ideas, it's a, it's a really difficult, it's a thing like that's almost impossible to define, right? Like what's different. So how, how do you think about that? So two examples is uh, I'm a huge fan of Three Blue One Brown, say, and then one diversity, I, I wasn't even aware of a channel called Veritasium, which is a great science, physics, whatever channel. So one version of diversity is showing me uh, Derek's Veritasium's channel, which I was really excited to discover. I actually now watch a lot of his videos. Okay, so you're a person who's watching some math channels and you might be interested in some other science or math channels. So like you mentioned, the first kind of diversity is just show you some some things from other channels that are related, uh, but not just, you know, not all the uh, three blue, one brown channel, throw in a couple others. So, so that's the, maybe the first kind of diversity that we started with many, many years ago. Um, taking a bigger leap is, uh, is about, I mean, the, the mechanisms we do, we use for that is, is we basically cluster videos and channels together mostly videos. We do every almost everything at the video level. And so we'll we'll make some kind of a cluster via some embedding process. And then um, and then measure, you know, what is the likelihood that a that users who watch one cluster might also watch another cluster that's very distinct. Mm -hmm. So we may come to find that um, that people who watch uh, science videos also like um, jazz. Uh, this is possible, right? And so, and so, um, because of that relationship that we've identified um, through the uh, measure through the embeddings and then the measurement of the people who watch both, we might recommend a jazz video once in a while. So there's this clustering in the embedding space of jazz videos and science videos, and so you kind of try to look at aggregate statistics where if a lot of people that jump from science cluster to the jazz cluster tend to remain as engaged or become more engaged, then that's that means those two 
are they should hop back and forth and they'll be, they'll be happy. Right. There's a higher likelihood that a person from who's watching science would like jazz than the person watching science would like I don't know, backyard railroads or or something else, right? And so we can try to measure these likelihoods and use that to make the best recommendation we can. So, okay, so we'll, we'll talk about the machine learning of that, but I have to linger on things that neither you or anyone have an answer to. There's gray areas of truth, which is, for example, now I can't believe I'm going there, but uh, politics, it... it <laughs> It happens so that certain people believe certain things and they're very certain about them. Let's move outside the red versus blue politics of today's world, but there's different ideologies. For example, in college, I, I read quite a lot of Ayn Rand. I studied, and that's a particular philosophical ideology I find I found it interesting to explore. Okay, so that was that kind of space. I've kind of moved on from that cluster uh, intellectually, but it nevertheless is an interesting cluster. There's, I was born in the Soviet Union, Socialism, communism is a certain kind of political ideology that's really interesting to explore. Again, objectively, just there's a set of beliefs about how the economy should work and so on. And so it's hard to know what's true or not in terms of people within those communities are often advocating that this is how we achieve utopia in this world. And they're pretty certain about it. So how do you try to manage politics in this chaotic, divisive world, not positive or any kind of ideas in terms of filtering what people should watch next and in terms of also not letting certain things be on YouTube. This is exceptionally difficult responsibility. Right. To well, um, the responsibility to get this right is our top priority. And, um, and the first comes down to making sure that we have good, clear rules of the road, right? Like uh, just because we have freedom of speech doesn't mean that you can literally say anything, right? Like we as a society have accepted certain um, restrictions on our freedom of speech. There are things like libel laws and, and things like that. And so um, where we can draw a clear line, we do, and we continue to evolve that line over time. Um, however, as you pointed out, wherever you draw the line, there's going to be a borderline. And in that borderline area, we are going to maybe not remove videos, but we will try to reduce the recommendations of them or the proliferation of them um, by demoting them. And then alternatively, in those situations, try to raise what we would call authoritative or credible sources of information. So we're not trying to, I mean, you mentioned Ayn Rand and um, communism. Uh, you know, those are those are two like valid points of view that people are going to debate and discuss. And and of course, people who uh, believe in one or the other of those things are going to try to persuade other people right. to their point of view. And so, um, we're not trying to settle that or choose a side or anything like that. What we're trying to do is make sure that the the people who are expressing those point of view and and um, offering those positions are authoritative and credible. So let me ask a question about people I don't like personally. You heard me. I don't care if you leave comments on this. Uh, is uh, and But the, sometimes they're brilliantly funny, which is trolls. So <laughs> people who kind of mock, I mean, the internet is full, Reddit of mock style comedy where people just kind of make fun of um, point out that the emperor has no clothes and there's brilliant comedy in that but sometimes it can get cruel and mean so on that on the mean point and sorry to linger on these things that have no good answers but actually I, I totally hear you that this is really important that you're trying to solve it but how do you reduce the meanness of people on YouTube <laughs> um, I understand that anyone who uploads YouTube videos has to become resilient to a certain amount of meanness. Like I've heard that from many creators and um, we would, we are trying in various ways, comment ranking, um, allowing certain features to block people to, to reduce or, or make that 
that meanness or that trolling behavior um, less effective on YouTube. Yeah. And so, uh, I mean, it, it's it's very important, um, but it's something that we're we're going to keep having to work on. And and you know, as as we improve it, like maybe we'll get to a point where uh, where people don't have to suffer this sort of meanness when they upload YouTube videos. I hope we do, but um, uh, you know, but it just does seem to be something that you have to be able to deal with as a YouTube creator nowadays. So do you have a hope that, so you mentioned two things that kind of agree with us. So there's like a machine learning approach of ranking comments based on whatever, based on how much they contribute to the healthy conversation. Let's put it that way. And the other is almost an interface question of how do you, how does the creator filter? So block or how, how does how do humans themselves, the users of YouTube manage their own conversation? Do you have hope that these two tools will create a better society without limiting freedom of speech too much? Without sort of, I don't even like saying that people are like, what do you mean limiting, <laughs> uh, sort of uh, curating speech? Yeah. I mean, I think that that, overall is our whole project here at YouTube. Right. Like yeah. we fundamentally believe, and I personally believe very much that YouTube can be great. It's been great for my kids. I think it can be great for society, um, but it's absolutely critical that we get this responsibility part right. And that's why it's our top priority. Susan Wojcicki, who's the CEO of YouTube, um, she says something that I personally find very inspiring, which is that we want to do our jobs today in a manner so that people 20 and 30 years from now will look back and say, you know, YouTube, they they really figured this out. They really found a way to strike the right balance between the openness and the value that the openness has and also making sure that we are meeting our responsibility to users and society. So the burden on YouTube actually is quite incredible. And the one thing that people don't, I don't give enough credit to the seriousness and the magnitude of the problem, I think. So uh, I, I personally hope that you do solve it because a lot is in your hand. Uh, on, <laughs> <laughs> a lot is riding on your success or failure. So it's besides, of course, running a successful company, you're also curating the content of the internet and the conversation on the internet. That's a, that's a powerful thing. So w one thing that people wonder about is how much of it can be solved with pure machine learning? So looking at the data, studying the data, and creating algorithms that curate uh, the comments, curate the content, and how much of it needs human intervention? Meaning people here at YouTube in a room sitting and thinking about what is the nature of truth? <laughs> what is uh, what are the ideals that we should be promoting? That kind of thing. So algorithm versus human input. What's your sense? I mean, my own experience has demonstrated that you need both of those things. Um, algorithms, I mean, you're familiar with machine learning algorithms, and the thing they need most is data. And the data is generated by humans. And so, for instance, um, when we're building a system to try to figure out which are the videos that are misinformation or borderline policy violations, well, the first thing we need to do is get human beings to make decisions about which, which of those videos are in which category. And then we use that data and, and basically you know, take that information that's, that's determined and governed by humans and and extrapolate it or, or apply it uh, to the entire set of billions of YouTube videos. And we couldn't, we, we, we couldn't get to all the videos on YouTube well without the humans, and we, we couldn't use the humans to get to all the videos of YouTube. So there's no world in which you have only one or the other of these things. Um, and just as you said, uh, a lot of it comes down to um, people at YouTube spending a lot of time trying to figure out what are the right policies, um, you know, what are the outcomes based on those policies, are they the kinds of things we want to see, uh, and then once we 
kind of get a get an agreement or or build some consensus around around what the policies are well then we've got to find a way to implement those policies across all of youtube and that's where both the human beings um, we call them evaluators or reviewers come into play to help us with that and then and then once we get a lot of training data from them then we apply the machine learning techniques to take it even further do you have a sense that these human beings have a bias in some kind of direction sort of uh, i mean that's an interesting question we do sort of in, in autonomous vehicles and computer vision in general a lot of annotation and we rarely ask what bias do the annotators have you know they're it, even in the sense that they're better than they're better at annotating certain things than others. For example, people are much better at for seg annotating segmentation at uh, segmenting cars in a scene versus segmenting bushes or trees. Uh, you know, there's specific mechanical reasons for that, but also because the cement it's semantic gray area and and just for a lot of reasons, people are just terrible at annotating trees. Okay, so in that same kind of sense, do you think of in terms of people reviewing videos or annotating the content of videos, is there some kind of bias that you're aware of or seek out in that human input? Well, we take steps to try to overcome these kinds of biases or biases that we think would be problematic. Um, so for instance, like we ask people to have a bias towards scientific consensus. That's something that we, we instruct them to do. Um, we ask them to have a bias towards uh, demonstration of expertise or credibility or authoritativeness. Um, but there are other biases that we that we want to make sure to try to remove. And there's many techniques for doing this. One of them is you you send the same thing to be reviewed to many people. And so um, you know that's one technique. Another is that you make sure that the people that are doing these sorts of uh, tasks, are from different backgrounds and different areas of the United States or of the world. But then, even with all of that, it's possible for certain kinds of uh, what we would call um, unfair biases to creep into machine learning systems, primarily, as you said, uh, because maybe the training data itself comes in right. in, a, in a biased way. And so we also have um, worked very hard on, the, on improving the machine learning systems to remove and reduce unfair biases when it's um, when it goes against or or ha has involved some protected class, for instance. Thank you for exploring with me some of the more challenging things. Uh, I'm sure there's a few more that we'll jump back to, but l let me jump into the fun part, which is um, maybe the basics of the quote unquote YouTube algorithm. What is the YouTube algorithm? look at to make recommendation for what to watch next from a machine learning perspective or when you search for a particular term how does it know what to show you next because it seems to at least for me do an incredible job of both <laughs> well that's kind of you to say it didn't used to do a very good job <laughs> um, but it's gotten better over the years uh, even even i observed that it's improved quite a bit um, those are two different situations. Like when you search for something, uh, YouTube uses the best technology we can get from Google um, to make sure that that the YouTube search system finds what someone's looking for. And of course, the very first things that one thinks about is, okay, well, does the word occur in the title, for instance? Um, uh, you know, but there, but there are much more sophisticated things um, where we're mostly trying to do some syntactic match or, or maybe a semantic match based on uh, words that we can add um, to the document itself. For instance, uh, you know, maybe is is this video uh, watched a lot after this query? Mm. Right. That's something that uh, we can observe, and then as a result, uh, make sure that that that. Uh, document would be retrieved for that query. Um, now, when you talk about what kind of videos would be recommended to watch next, um, that's something, again, we've been working on for many years. And probably the first um, 
the first real attempt to do that well was to use collaborative filtering. So you can you describe what collaborative filtering is? Sure. It's just um, basically what we do is we observe which videos get watched close together by the same person. And if you observe that, and if you can imagine creating a graph where the videos that get watched close together by the most people are sort of very close to one another in this graph and videos that don't frequently get watched close to close together by the same person or, or the same people are far apart, then you end up with this um, gr graph that we call the related graph that basically represents videos that are very similar or related in some way. And what's amazing about that is that uh, it puts all the videos that are in the same language together, for instance. Mm. And we didn't even have to think about language. It yeah. just does it, yeah. right? And it puts all the videos that are about sports together, and it puts most of the music videos together, and it puts all of these sorts of videos together um, just because that's sort of the way the people using YouTube behave. So that already cleans up a lot of the problem it, it it takes care of the lowest hanging fruit, which is, happens to be a huge one of just managing these millions of videos. That's right. Um, I remember a few years ago, I was talking to someone who was um, uh, trying to propose that we do a, a research project concerning people who um, who are bilingual. And this person was uh, making this proposal based on the idea that YouTube could not possibly be good at recommending videos well to people who are bilingual. And so um, she was telling me uh, about this and I said, well, can you give me an example of what problem do you think we have on YouTube with the recommendations? And so she said, well, I'm a, um, a researcher in, in the US and, and when I'm looking for academic topics, I want to look, I want to see them in English. And so she searched for one, found a video, and then looked at the watch next suggestions, and they were all in English. Mm -hmm. And so she said, oh, I see. YouTube must think that I speak only English. And so she said, now, I'm actually originally from Turkey, and sometimes when I'm cooking, let's say I want to make some baklava, I really like to watch videos that are in Turkish. And so she searched for a video about making the baklava and then, and then selected it, and it was in Turkish, and the watch next recommendations were in Turkish. And mm -hmm. she just couldn't believe how this was possible. <laughs> and, and how is it that you know that I speak both these two languages and put all the videos together? And it's just as a, a, a sort of an outcome of this related graph that's created through collaborative filtering. So for me, one of my huge interests is just human psychology, right? And, and that's such a powerful platform on which to utilize human psychology to, to discover what people, individual people want to watch next. But it's also be just fascinating to me you know, I've uh, Google search has ability to look at your own history. And I've done that before, just, just what I've searched through the years, for many, many years. And it's a fascinating picture of who I am, actually. And um, I don't think anyone's ever summarized. I personally would love that, a summary of who I am as a person on the internet to me. <laughs> because I think it reveals, I, I think it puts a mirror to me or to, to others, you know, that's actually quite revealing and interesting. You know, uh, just uh, maybe the number of, it's, it's a joke, but not really is the number of cat videos I've watched <laughs> or videos of people falling, you know, stuff that's absurd, uh, th that kind of stuff. It's really interesting. And of course, it's really good for the machine learning aspect to, uh, to, to, to show, uh, to figure out what to show next, but it's interesting. Um, Hey, have you just as a tangent played around with the idea of giving a map to people sort of, as opposed to just using this information to show what's next, showing them here are the clusters you've loved over the years kind of thing? Well, we do provide the history of all the videos that you've watched. Yes. So you can definitely search through that and, and look through it and search through it to see what it is that you've been watching on YouTube. Uh, we have actually in various times um, experimented with this sort of cluster idea, finding ways to demonstrate or show people um, 
what topics they've been interested in or what what clusters they've watched from. It's interesting that you bring this up because um, in some sense, the, the way the recommendation system of YouTube sees a user is exactly as the history of all the videos they've watched on YouTube. And so you can think of um, yourself or, or, or any user on YouTube as kind of like a, a DNA <laughs> strand, strand yeah. of all your videos, right? Um, that sort of represents you. Uh, you can also think of it as maybe a vector in the space of all the videos on YouTube. And so, you know, now once you think of it as a vector in the space of all the videos on YouTube, then you can start to say, okay, well, you know, which videos, which, which other vectors are close to me and uh, to my vector. And, um, and that's one of the ways that we generate some diverse recommendations is because yeah. you're like, okay, well, you know, these, these people seem to be close with respect to the videos they've watched on YouTube, but, you know, here's a topic or a video that one of them has watched and enjoyed, but the other one hasn't that could be an opportunity uh, to make a good recommendation. I got to tell you, I mean, I know I'm, I'm going to ask for things that are impossible, but I would love to cluster than human beings. Like, I would love to know who has similar trajectories as me because we probably <laughs> would want to hang out, right? There's a social aspect there. Like, actually finding some of the most fascinating people f I find on YouTube have, like, no followers. And I start following them, and they create incredible content. And, you know, and on that topic, I just love to ask there's some videos that just blow my mind in terms of quality and depth and just in every regard are amazing videos and they have like 57 views okay how do you get a videos of quality to be seen by many eyes so the measure of quality is it just something yeah how, how do you know that something is good well i mean i think it depends initially on what sort of video we're talking about. So um, in the realm of, let's say, you, you mentioned politics and news. Yes. In that realm, um, you know, quality news or quality journalism relies on having a journalism uh, department, right? Like you, you, you have to have actual journalists and fact checkers and people like that. Um, and so in that situation, and in others, maybe science or in medicine, um, quality has a lot to do with the authoritativeness and the credibility and the expertise of the people who make the video. Now, if you think about the other end of the spectrum, uh, you know, what is the highest quality prank video? Or what is the highest quality um, right. Minecraft video? Yeah. Right? Uh, that might be the one that people enjoy watching the most and watch to the end. Or it might be... Um, the one that uh, when we ask people the next day after they watched it, were they satisfied with it? And so we, in, in, especially in the realm of entertainment, um, have been trying to get at better and better measures of quality or satisfaction or enrichment since I came to YouTube. And, and we started with, well, you know, the first approximation is the one that gets more views. But, um, but you know, we, we both know that things can get a lot of views and not really be that high quality, uh, especially if people are clicking on something and then immediately realizing that it's not that great and abandoning it. Um, and that's why we moved from views to thinking about the amount of time people spend watching it with the premise that, like, you know, in some sense, the time that someone spends watching a video is related to the value that they get from that video. It may not be perfectly related, but it has something to say about how much value they get. Um, but even that's not good enough, right? Because uh, I myself have spent time clicking through channels on television late at night and ended up watching Under Siege 2 for <laughs> some reason I don't know. And if you were to ask me the next day, are you glad that you watched that show on TV last night, I'd say, yeah, I wish I would have gone to bed or read a book or almost anything else, really. Yeah. Um, and so that's why uh, some people got the idea a few years ago to try to survey users afterwards. And so, um, so we get feedback data from those surveys and then use that in the machine learning system to try to not just predict what you're going to click on right now, 
what you might watch for a while, but what when we ask you tomorrow, you'll give four or five stars to. Mm. So just to summarize, what are the signals from a machine learning perspective that the user can provide? So you mentioned just clicking on the video views, the time watched, maybe the relative time watched, the uh, the clicking like and dislike on the video, maybe commenting on the video. All of those things. All of those things. And yes. then the, the one I wasn't actually quite aware of, even though I might've engaged in it, is uh, a survey afterwards, which is a brilliant idea. Is there other signals I mean, that's already a really rich space of signals to learn from. Is there something else? That well, you mentioned commenting, also sharing the video. If you if you think it's worthy to be shared with someone else you know. Within YouTube or outside of YouTube as well? Either. Either. Let's see, you mentioned like, dislike. Yeah, like and dislike. How important is that? Uh, it's very important, right? We want, it, it's predictive of satisfaction. Uh, but it's not, it's not, perfectly predictive, um, subscribe. If you subscribe to the channel of the person who made the video, then that also is a piece of information and it signals um, satisfaction. Although over the years, we've learned that people have a wide range of attitudes about what it means to subscribe. Right. Um, we would ask some users who didn't subscribe very much, why, but they watched a lot from a few channels, we'd say, well, why didn't you subscribe? And they would say, well, I, I can't afford to pay for anything. <laughs> um, and, you know, we tried to let them understand, like, actually, it doesn't cost anything. It's free. It just helps us know that you are very interested in this creator. Um, but then we've asked other people who subscribe to many things and, and don't really watch any of the videos from those channels. And we say, well, well why did you subscribe to this if you weren't really interested in any more videos from that channel. And they might tell us, um, well, I just, you know, I thought the person did a great job and I just want to kind of give them a high five. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so. Yeah, that's where I, I sit. I actually subscribe to channels where I just, this person is amazing. I, I like this person, but then uh, I like this person. I really want to support them. Uh, that that's how I click subscribe, right. even, even though I mean never actually want to click on their videos when they're <laughs> releasing it. I just love what they're doing, and it's maybe outside of my interest area uh, and so on, which is probably the wrong way to use the subscribe button. But I just want to say congrats. This is great work. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I you mean, have to deal with all the space of people that see the subscribe it, button is totally different. That's thing. right, and so you know we we can't just close our eyes and say, sorry, you're using it wrong. You know, it, we're, we're not going to pay attention to what you've done. Um, we need to embrace all the ways in which all the like different it. people in the world use the subscribe button or the like and the dislike button. So in terms of signals of machine learning, uh, using for the search and for the recommendation, you've mentioned titles, so like metadata, like text data that people provide, description and title and maybe keywords. So maybe you can speak to the value of those things in search and also this incredible, fascinating area of the content itself. So the video content itself, trying to understand what's happening in the video. So YouTube released a data set that, you know, in the, in the machine learning computer vision world, this is just an exciting space. How much is that currently, how much are you playing with that currently? How much is your hope for the future of being able to analyze the content of the video itself? Well, we have been working on that also since I came to YouTube. So analyzing the content. Analyzing the, the content wow. of the video, right? Awesome. Um, and uh, what I can tell you is that uh, our ability to do it well is still somewhat crude. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can tell if it's a music video. We can tell if it's a sports video. We can probably tell you that people are playing soccer. Um, we probably can't tell whether it's... Uh, Manchester United or my daughter's soccer team. So th these things are kind of difficult and and using them, we, we can use them in some ways. So for instance, we use that kind of information to understand and inform these clusters that I talked about. Uh, and also maybe to add some words like soccer, for instance, to the video, if, if it doesn't occur in the title or the description, which is remarkable that often it doesn't. Um, right. 
I one of the <laughs> things that I ask uh, creators to do is is please help us out with the title and the description. Um, for instance, we were um, a few years ago having a live stream of some competition for World of Warcraft on YouTube. And um, it was a very important competition. But if you typed World of Warcraft in search, you wouldn't find it. World of Warcraft wasn't in the title? World of Warcraft wasn't in the title. Oh, it was match bad. 478, yeah. you know, A team versus B team. And World of Warcraft wasn't in the title. Yeah. I'm just like, come on, give, me, being give me literal, a Being literal on the internet is actually very uncool which is the problem. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, in some sense, well, some of the greatest videos, I mean, there's a humor to just being indirect, being witty and so on, and actually being, uh, you know, machine learning algorithms want you to be, you know, literal, right? You, you just wanna say what's in the thing, be very, very simple. And in, in some sense that gets away from wit and humor. So you have to play with both, right? So, but you're saying that for now, sort of um, the content of the title, the content of the description, the actual text is is one of the best ways to uh, for the for the algorithm to find your video and put them in the right cluster. That's right. and and I would go further and say that uh, if you want people, human beings, to select your video in search, then it helps to have, let's say, World of Warcraft in the title because, why would a person, you know, if they're looking at a bunch, they type World of Warcraft and they have a bunch of videos, all of whom say World of Warcraft, except the one that you uploaded. Mm -hmm. Well, even the person is going to think, well, maybe this isn't somehow search made a mistake. This isn't really about World of Warcraft. So it's important not just for the machine learning systems, but also for the people who might be looking for this sort of thing. They get a a clue that it's what they're looking for by seeing that same thing prominently in the title of the video. Okay, let me push back on that. So I think from the algorithm perspective, yes, but if they typed in World of Warcraft and saw a video that with the title simply winning and, and, and the thumbnail has like a sad um, orc or something, I don't know, <laughs> right? Like, I think that's much, it's, it, it, it uh, gets your curiosity up. And then if they could trust that the algorithm was smart enough to figure out somehow that this is indeed a World of Warcraft video, that would have created the most beautiful experience. I, I think in terms of just the wit and the humor and the curiosity that we human beings naturally have. But you're saying, I mean, realistically speaking, it's really hard for the algorithm to figure out that the content of that video will be a World of Warcraft video. And you have to accept that some people are going to skip it. Yeah. It, right? I mean, and so you're right. Uh, the people who don't skip it and select it are going to be delighted. Yeah. Um, but other people Some might say, yeah, th this is not what I was looking for. And making stuff discoverable, I think, is what you're really um, working on and hoping. So, yeah. So from your perspective, t put stuff in the title and description. And, and remember, the collaborative filtering part of the system right. starts by the same user watching videos together, right? So the way that they're probably gonna do that is by searching for them. That's a fascinating aspect of it. It's like ant colonies. That's how they find stuff is. So, I mean, in what degree for collaborative filtering in general is one curious ant, one curious user essential? So sort of just a person who is more willing to click on random videos and sort of explore these cluster spaces. In your sense, how many people are just like watching the same thing over and over and over and over? And how many are just like the explorers? They just <laughs> kind of like click on stuff and then help help the other ant in the <laughs> ant's colony discover the cool stuff. Do you have a sense of that at all? I really don't think I have a sense for the <laughs> okay. relative sizes of those groups. But I, but I would say that, you know, people come to YouTube with some certain amount of intent and, as long as they, um, to the extent to which they they try to satisfy that intent, that certainly helps our systems, right? Because our systems rely on, on kind of a faithful amount of behavior, the right? Like, uh, um, and there are people who try to trick us, right? There are people and machines that try to um, associate videos together that really don't belong together, but they're trying to get that association made because it's profitable for them. And so we have to always be resilient to that sort of uh, attempt at gaming the systems. So 
Speaking to that, there's a lot of people that, in, in a positive way, perhaps I don't know. I I don't like it, but like to gain, want to try to game the system to get more attention. Everybody, creators, in a positive sense, want to get attention, right? So how do you how do you work in this space when people create more and more um, sort of clickbaity titles and thumbnails? Sort of uh, very tasking. Derek has made a video where basically <laughs> describes that. It seems what works is to create a high quality video, really good video, what people would want to watch and once they click on it, but have clickbaity titles and thumbnails to get them to click on it in the first place. And he's saying, I'm embracing this fact, I'm just gonna keep doing it. And I hope you forgive me for doing it. <laughs> and you will enjoy my videos once you click on them. So in what sense do you see this kind of clickbait style attempt to manipulate to, to, to get people in the door to manipulate the algorithm or play with the algorithm or game the algorithm? I think that, that you can look at it as an attempt to game the algorithm, but um, even if you were to take the algorithm out of it and just say, okay, well, all these videos happen to be lined up, which the algorithm didn't make any decision about which one to put at the top or the bottom, but they're all lined up there, which one are the people gonna choose? And And I'll tell you the same thing that I told Derek is, um, you know, I have a bookshelf and they have two kinds of books on them, uh, science books. Mm -hmm. Um, I have my math books from when I was a student and they all look identical except for the titles on the covers. Mm -hmm. They're all yellow. They're all from Springer and they're every single one of them. The cover is totally the same. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. On the other hand, I have other more pop science type books. And they all have very interesting covers, right? And, and they have provocative uh, titles and things like that. I mean, I wouldn't say that they're clickbaity because they are indeed good books. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that they cross any line, but, uh, but you know, the, that's just a decision you have to make, right? Like the people who, who write classical recursion theory by Piero di Freddi, yeah. he was fine yeah. with the yellow title and the and, the, and and nothing more. Whereas I think other people who who wrote a more popular type book uh, understand that they need to have a compelling cover and a compelling title, and uh, and you know I, I don't think there's anything really wrong with that. We we do we do take steps to make sure that there is a line that you don't cross. And if you go too far, maybe your thumbnail is especially racy or, or um, you know, it's all cats with too many exclamation points. We <laughs> observe that um, users are kind of, uh, you know, sometimes offended by that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so for the users who are offended by that, we will then depress or suppress those videos. And which reminds me, there's also another signal where users can say, I don't know if it was recently added, but I really enjoy it. Just saying, I don't, I didn't, something like, I, I don't want to see this video anymore or something like, <laughs> <laughs> like this is a, like there's certain videos that just cut me the wrong way. Like just, just jump out at me. It's like, I don't want to, I don't want this. And it feels really good to clean that up, <laughs> to be like, I don't, that's not, that's not for me. I don't know. I, I think that might have been recently added, but it's, that's also a really strong signal. Yes, absolutely. Right. We don't want to make a recommendation that uh, people are unhappy with. And that makes me that particular one makes me feel good as a user in general uh, and as a machine learning person because I feel like I'm helping the algorithm. My interactions on YouTube don't always feel like I'm helping the algorithm. Like I'm not reminded of that fact. Uh, like for example, uh, Tesla and Autopilot and Elon Musk create a feeling for their customers, for people that own Teslas, that they're helping the algorithm of Tesla vehicle. Right. Like they're all like are really proud they're helping right. the fleet learn. I think YouTube doesn't always remind people that you're helping the algorithm get smarter. And for me, I, I love that idea. Like we're all collaboratively, like Wikipedia gives that sense. They're all together creating a, a beautiful thing. YouTube is uh, doesn't always remind me of that. It's, uh, this conversation is reminding me of that, but. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a good tip. We should keep that fact in mind when we design these features. I, I'm not sure I, I really thought about it that way, but that's a very interesting perspective. It's an interesting question of personalization that I feel like when I click like on a video, I'm just improving my experience. 
it would be great. It would make me personally, people are different, but make me feel great if I was helping also the YouTube algorithm broadly say something. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a, that, I don't know if that's human nature, but you want the products you love, and I certainly love YouTube, like you want to help it get smarter and smarter and smarter because there's some kind of coupling between our lives together <laughs> <laughs> being better. If, if YouTube was better, then I will, my life will be better. And that's that kind of reasoning. I'm not sure what that is. And I'm not sure how many people share that feeling. <laughs> that could be just a machine learning feeling. But on that point, how much personalization is there in terms of next video recommendations? So is it kind of all really boiling down to clustering? Like you find the nearest clusters to me and so on and that, um, that kind of thing? Or is it, how much is personalized to me, the individual completely? It's very, very personalized. So um, your experience will be quite a bit different from anybody else's who's watching that same video, uh, at least when they're logged in. And um, the reason is, is that we, we found that, that users often want two different kinds of things when they're watching a video. Sometimes they wanna keep watching more on that topic or more in that genre. And other times they just, are done and they're ready to move on to something else. And so the question is, well, what is the something else? And one of the first things one can imagine is, well, maybe something else is um, the latest video from some channel to which you've subscribed. And that's gonna be very different from for you than it is for me, right? And And even if it's not something that you subscribe to, it's something that you watch a lot. And again, that'll be very different on a person by person basis. And so, um, even the watch next, as well as the homepage, of course, is quite personalized. So what, we mentioned some of the signals, but what does success look like? What, what does success look like in terms of the algorithm creating a great long-term experience for a user? Or to put another way, if you look at the videos I've watched this month, how do you know the algorithm succeeded for me? I think, first of all, if you come back and watch more YouTube, then that's one indication that you found some value from it. So just the number of hours is a powerful indicator. Well, I mean, not the hours themselves, but um, uh, the fact that you return on another day. Mm. Um, so that's probably the most simple indicator. Uh, people don't come back to things that they don't find value in, right? There's a lot of other things that they could do. Um, but like I said, I mean, ideally, we would like everybody to feel that YouTube enriches their lives and that every video they watched is the best one they've ever watched since they've started watching YouTube. And so that's why uh, we survey them and ask them like, is this one to five stars? And so our version of success is uh, every time someone takes that survey, they say it's five stars. And if we ask them, is this the best video you've ever seen on YouTube? They say yes every single time. So um, it's hard to imagine that we would actually achieve that. Maybe asymptotically we would get there, but uh, but that would be what we think success is. It's funny, I've recently said somewhere, I don't know, maybe tweeted, but uh, that uh, Ray Dalio has this video on the, the economic machine, I forget what it's called, but it's a 30 minute video. And I said, it's the, the greatest video I've ever watched on YouTube. It's It's like, I watched the whole thing and my mind was blown is a very crisp, clean des description of how the, at least the American economic system works. It's a beautiful video. And I was just, I wanted to click on something to say this is the best thing. <laughs> this is the best thing ever, please let me, I can't believe I discovered it. Uh, I mean, the, the views and the likes reflect its quality, but I was almost upset that I haven't found it earlier and wanted to find other things like it. I don't think I've ever felt that this is the best video I've ever watched. <laughs> that was that. And uh, to me, the ultimate utopia, the best experience is where every single video, where I don't see any of the videos I regret and every single video I watch is one that actually helps me grow, helps me enjoy life, be happy and so on. Um, well, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's a heck of a, that's a, that's one of the most beautiful and ambitious, I think, machine learning tasks. So when you look at a society as opposed to an individual user, 
do you think of how YouTube is changing society when you have these millions of people watching videos, growing, learning, changing, having debates? Do you, do you have a sense of, yeah, what the big impact on society is? Because I think it's huge, but do you have a sense of what direction <laughs> we're taking this world? Well, I mean, I think, you know, openness has had an impact on society already. Uh, there's a lot of... Um, what do you mean by openness? Well, the fact that um, uh, unlike other mediums, there's not someone sitting at YouTube who decides before you can upload your video whether it's worth having you upload it right? Um, or, or worth anybody seeing it really, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, there are some creators who say, like, I, I wouldn't have this opportunity to, to reach an audience. Uh, Tyler Oakley often said that, you know, he wouldn't have had this opportunity to reach this audience if it weren't for YouTube. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's one way in which YouTube has changed society. Um, I know that there are people that I work with from uh, outside the United States, especially in, from places where uh, literacy is low. Mm -hmm. And they think that YouTube can help in those places because you don't need to be able to read and write in order to learn something important for your life. Maybe, um, you know, how to do some job or how to fix something. Uh, and so that's another way in which I think YouTube is possibly changing society. So I've, I've worked at YouTube for eight, almost nine years now. And it's fun because I meet people and, you know, you tell them where they, where you work, you say you work on YouTube and they immediately say, I love YouTube. Yeah. Right. Which is great. Makes me feel great. Uh, but then, of course, when I ask them, well, what is it that you love about YouTube? Not one time ever has anybody said that the search works outstanding or that the recommendations are great. Um, what they always say when I ask them, what do you love about YouTube, is they immediately start talking about some channel or some creator or some topic or some community that they found on YouTube and that they just love. Yeah. And so... That has made me realize that YouTube is really about the video and connecting the people with the videos. And then everything else kind of gets out of the way. So beyond the video, it's an interesting because you kind of mentioned creator. What about the connection with just the individual creators as opposed to just individual video? So like I gave the example of Ray Dahlia video that the video itself is incredible. But there's some people who are just creators that uh, I love that they're, one of the cool things about people who call themselves YouTubers or whatever is they have a journey. They usually, almost all of them are, hor they suck horribly in the beginning <laughs> and then they, they kind of grow, you know, and then there's that genuineness in their growth. So, you know, I, YouTube clearly wants to help creators connect with their audience in this kind of way. So how do you think about that process of helping creators grow, helping them connect with their audience, develop not just individual videos, but the entirety of a creator's life on YouTube? Well, I mean, we're trying to help creators find the biggest audience that they can find. And the reason why that's you, you brought up creator versus video. The yeah. reason why creator channel is so important is because um, if we have a hope of, of people coming back to YouTube, well, they have to have in their minds some sense of what they're going to find when they come back to YouTube. If YouTube were just the next viral video, and I have no concept of what the next viral video could be. One time it's a cat playing a piano and the next day it's uh, uh, some children interrupting a reporter and the next day it's, you know, uh, some other thing happening. Um, then, then it's hard for me to, to when I'm not watching YouTube, say, gosh, I, I really, you know, would like to see something from someone or about something, right? And so that's why I think this connection between fans and creator is so important um, uh, for both because it's it's a way of, uh, of sort of fostering a relationship that can play out into the future. Let me 
talk about kind of a a dark and interesting question in general. And again, a topic that you or nobody has an answer to, but social media has a sense of, you know, it gives us highs and it gives us lows in the sense that uh, sort of creators often speak about having sort of burn burnout and having psychological ups and downs and challenges mentally in terms of continuing the creation process. There's a momentum, there's a huge excited audience that makes everybody feel, that makes creators feel great. And I, I think it's more than just financial. I think it's literally just, they love that sense of community. It's part of the reason I upload to YouTube. I don't care about money, never will. What I care about is the the, the community. But some people feel like this momentum and even when there's times in their life when they don't feel, you know, the, for some reason don't feel like creating. So how do you think about burnout, this mental exhaustion that some YouTube creators go through? Is that something we have an answer for? Is that something, how do we even think about that? Well, the first thing is we want to make sure that the YouTube systems are not contributing to this right. sense, right? And so um, we've done a fair amount of research to demonstrate that, you can absolutely take a break. If you are a creator and you've been uploading a lot, uh, we have just as many examples of people who took a break and came back more popular than they were before as we have examples of going the other way. Yeah, can we pause on that for a second? So the feeling that people have, I think, is if I take a break, everybody, well, the party will leave, right? So if you could just linger on that. So in your sense that taking a break is okay. Yes, taking a break is absolutely okay. And the reason I say that is because um, we have we can observe many examples of being of creators um, coming back very strong and even stronger after they have taken some sort of break. And so I just want to dispel the myth that this somehow um, necessarily uh, means that your channel is going to go down or or lose views. That is not the case. We know for sure that this is not a necessary outcome. Um, and the, so we we want to encourage people to make sure that they take care of themselves. That yeah. is job one, right? Like you you have to look after yourself and your mental health. Um, and you know, I think that it probably, in some of these cases, uh, contributes to. Uh, better videos once they come back, right? Because a lot of people, I mean, I know myself, if I'm burnt out on something, then I'm probably not doing my best work, even though I can keep working uh, until I pass out. And so um, I think that the the taking a break uh, may even improve the creative ideas that someone has. Okay, I think that's a really important thing to sort of to dispel. I think that applies to all of social media. Like literally, I've taken a break for a day every once in a while. <laughs> sorry, sorry if that sounds like a short time. <laughs> but even like uh, sort of email, just taking a break from email or only checking email once a day, especially when you're going through something psychologically in your personal life or so on, or really not sleeping much because of work deadlines, it can refresh you in a way that's uh, that's profound. And so the same applies. And it was there when you came back, right? It's there. So when, and and it looks different actually when you come back. You're sort of brighter eyed with some coffee, everything, the world looks better. So it's, it's important to take a break when you need it. So you've mentioned kind of the, the YouTube algorithm isn't, you know, E equals MC squared. It's not a single equation. It's, it's potentially sort of more than a million lines of code. Sort of, is it, more akin to what autonomous successful autonomous vehicles today are, which is they're just basically patches on top of patches of heuristics and human experts really tuning the algorithm and have some machine learning modules, or is it becoming more and more a giant machine learning system with humans just doing a little bit of tweaking here and there? What's your sense? First of all, do you even have a sense of what is the YouTube algorithm at this point? And whichever, however much you do have a sense, what does it look like? Well, we don't usually think about it as the algorithm um, because it's a bunch of systems that right. work on different services. Uh, the other thing that I think people don't understand is that what you might refer to as the YouTube algorithm from outside of YouTube 
is actually a you know a bunch of code and machine learning systems and heuristics, but that's married with the behavior of all the people who come to YouTube every day. So the people are part of the code essentially. <laughs> exactly, right? Like if there were no people who came to YouTube tomorrow, then their the algorithm wouldn't work anymore. Right. Right? So that's a critical part of the algorithm. And so when people talk about, well, the algorithm does this, the algorithm does that, it's sometimes hard to understand. Well, you know, it could be the 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 viewers are doing that and the algorithm is mostly just keeping track of what the viewers do and then reacting to those things um, in in sort of more fine-grained situations. And I and I think that this is the way that the recommendation system and the search system and and probably many machine learning systems evolve is, you know, you start trying to solve a problem. And the first way to solve a problem is often with a simple heuristic, right? And and you know, you want to say, what are the videos we're going to recommend? Well, how about the most popular ones, right? And <laughs> that's yeah. where you start. Right. Um, and and over time, you collect some data and you refine your situation so that you're making less heuristics and you're you're building a system that can actually learn what to do in different situations based on some observations of those situations in the past, and uh, and you keep chipping away at these heuristics over time. And so I think that. Um, just like with diversity, uh, you know, I think the first diversity uh, measure we took was, okay, not more than three videos in a row from the same channel, right? It's a pretty simple heuristic yeah. to encourage diversity, but it worked, right? You, who needs to see four, five, six videos in a row from the same channel? Um, and over time, we try to chip away at that and, and make it more fine-grained and, and basically have it remove the heuristics in favor of something that can react to individuals and individual situations. So how do you, you mentioned, you know, we we know that something worked. How do you get a sense when decisions are the kind of A-B testing that this idea was a good one, this was not so good? Uh, what's, how do you measure that? And uh, across which time scale, across how many users, that kind of, that kind of thing? Well, you mentioned that A-B experiments. And so uh, just about every single change we make to YouTube, uh, we do it only after we've run a A-B experiment. Mm -hmm. And so in those experiments, which run from one week to months, um, we measure hundreds, literally hundreds of different variables and and measure changes with confidence intervals in all of them. Because we really are trying to get a sense for ultimately, does this improve the experience for viewers? That's the question we're trying to answer. And an experiment is one way um, because we can see certain things go up and down. So for instance, um, if we notice in the experiment, people are dismissing videos less frequently or they're um, saying that they're more satisfied. They're giving more videos five stars after they watch them. Then those would be indications of uh, that the experiment is successful, that it's improving the situation for viewers. Um, but we can also look at other things, like we might do uh, user studies where we invite some people in and ask them, like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? How do you feel about this? Um, and other various kinds of user research. But ultimately, before we launch something, we're gonna to wanna to run an experiment. So we get a sense for uh, what the impact is gonna be, not just to the viewers, but also to the different channels and all of that. An absurd question, nobody knows. Well, actually it's interesting, maybe there's an answer, but uh, if I want to make a viral video, how do I do it? I don't know how you make a viral video. I, I know that we have in the past tried to figure out if we could detect when a video, video was going to go viral. Mm -hmm. You know, and those were, you, know, you take the first and second derivatives of the view count and maybe use that to um, do some prediction. But, um, but I can't say we ever got very good at that. Uh, oftentimes we look at where the traffic was coming from. You know, if it's if it if a lot of the viewership is coming from something like Twitter, uh, then then maybe it has a higher chance of becoming viral than maybe if than than if it were coming from search or something. Um, but that was just trying to detect a video that might be viral. How to make one? Like 
I have no idea. I mean, so, you, uh, you you get your kids to interrupt you while you're yeah. <laughs> uh, on the on the news or something. Absolutely. Uh, but after the fact, on a one individual video, sort of ahead of time predicting is a really hard task. But after the, the video went viral in analysis, can you sometimes understand why it went viral from the perspective of YouTube broadly? First of all, is it even interesting for YouTube that a particular video is vi is viral, or is does that not matter for the individual, for, for the experience of people? Well, I think people expect that if a video video is going viral and it's something they would be interested in, then I would, I think they would expect YouTube to recommend it to them. Right. Um, so if something's going viral, it's good to just let the wave, let, let people <laughs> ride the wave of it, its viralness. Well, I mean, we want to meet people's expectations in that way, of course. So, like, like I mentioned, I hung out with Derek Mueller a while ago, uh, a couple months back. He's actually the person who suggested I talk to you on this podcast. All right. Well, thank you, Derek. <laughs> at, at that time, he just recently posted uh, an awesome science video titled, Why Are 96 Million Black Balls on This Reservoir? And in a matter of, I don't know how long, but like a few days, he got 38 million views and it's still growing. Is this something you can analyze and understand why it happened, this video or any one particular video like it? I mean, we can surely see where it was recommended, where it was found, who watched it, and those sorts of things. So it's actually, sorry to interrupt, it is the video which helped me discover who Derek is. I didn't know who he is before. <laughs> so I, I remember, you know, usually I just have all of these technical, boring MIT Stanford talks in my recommendation, because that's what I watch. And then all of a sudden there's this black balls in a reservoir video with like an excited <laughs> nerd in the, with like just, and uh, why is this being recommended to me? So I clicked on it and watched the whole thing. And it was awesome. But, and then a lot of people had that experience, like why was I recommended this? But they all of course watched it and enjoyed it, which is, what's your sense of this just wave of recommendation that, are, that comes with this viral video that ultimately people get enjoy after they click on it? Well, I think it's the system, you know, basically doing what anybody who's recommending something would do, which is, you show it to some people and if they like it, you say, okay, well, can I find some more people who are a little bit like them? Okay, I'm gonna try it with them. Oh, they like it too. Yeah. Let me expand the circle and some more, just, find some more people. Oh, it turns out they like it too. So and you just keep going until you get some feedback that says that, no, now you've gone too far. These people don't like it anymore. Right. Um, and so I, I think that's basically what happened. Now, um, you asked me about how to make a video go viral or make a viral video. I don't think that uh, if you or I decided to make a video about 96 million balls, that it would also go viral. Yeah. It's possible that <laughs> Derek made like um, the canonical video yeah. about those black balls yeah. in the lake. And exactly. so um, he did actually. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And, and so I don't know whether or not uh, just following along is the secret. Right. Yeah, but it's fascinating. I mean, just like you said, the algorithm sort of expanding that circle and then figuring out that more and more people did enjoy it and that sort of uh, phase shift of just a huge number of people enjoying it and the algorithm quickly, automatically, I assume, figuring that out. That's a, I don't know, the dynamics of psychology that is a beautiful thing. And so what do you think about the idea of, of clipping? Like and, uh, too many people annoyed me into doing it, which is they were requesting it. They said it would be very <laughs> beneficial. <laughs> to add clips in, in like the the coolest points and actually have explicit videos. Like I'm re-uploading a video, like a short clip, which is what the, the podcasts are doing. Yeah. Do, do you see, as opposed to like, I also add timestamps for the topics, you know, people want the clip. Do you see YouTube somehow helping creators with that process or helping connect clips to the original videos? Well, or is that just on a long list of amazing features to, <laughs> to work towards? Yeah, I mean, it's not something that I think we've we've done yet, but I can tell you that um, I think clipping is great, and I think it's actually great for you as a creator. Right. And here's the reason: um, if you think about, I mean, let's let's say the NBA is uploading uh, videos of of its games. Well, people might search for warriors versus rockets or they might search for steph curry right. 
Mm-hmm. And so a highlight from the game in which Steph Curry makes an amazing shot um, is an opportunity for someone to find a portion of that video. And so I think that um, you never know how people are going to search for something that you've created. And so you want to, I would say, you want to make clips and and add titles and things like that so that they can find it. Um as easily as possible. Do you have a dream of a future, perhaps a distant future, when the YouTube algorithm figures that out, sort of automatically detects the parts of the video that are really interesting, exciting, potentially exciting for people, and sort of clip them out in this incredibly rich space? Because if you talk about, if you talk even just this conversation, we probably covered 30, 40 little topics. And there's a huge space of users that would find, you know, 30% of those topics really interesting. And that space is very different. It's something that's beyond my ability to clip (laughs) out, right? But the algorithm might be able to figure all that out, sort of expand into clips. Do you have a, do you think about this kind of thing? Do you have a hope, a dream that one day the algorithm will be able to do that kind of deep content analysis? Well, we've actually had projects that attempt to achieve this, uh, but it really does depend on understanding the video well, and our understanding of the video right now is quite crude. And so um, I think it would be especially hard to do it with a conversation like this. Uh, One might be able to do it with... um, let's say a soccer match more easily, right? You could probably find out where the goals were scored. And then of course you you need to figure out who it was that scored the goal right. and, and that might require a human to do some annotation. But I think that um, trying to identify coherent topics in a transcript like, like the one of yeah. our conversation is, um, is not something that we're going to be very good at right away. And I was speaking more to the general problem, actually, of being able to do both a soccer match and our conversation right. without explicit <laughs> sort of uh, almost. My my hope was that there exists an algorithm that's able to find exciting things in video. So Google now on um, Google search will help you find the segment of the video that you're interested in. So if you uh, search for something like how to change the filter in my dishwasher, then if there's a long video about your dishwasher and this is the part where the person shows you how to change the filter, then then it will highlight that area and, and provide a link directly to it. And do you know if, from your recollection, do you know if the thumbnail reflects, like what's the difference between showing the full video and the shorter clip? Do you know what, how it's presented in search results? I don't remember how it's presented. And the other thing I would uh, say is that right now it's based on creator annotations. Ah, got it. So it's not the thing we're talking about, which <laughs> but is there, the- but, but folks are working on the more um, automatic version. It's interesting, people might not imagine this, but a lot of our systems start by using almost entirely the audience behavior. Mm -hmm. And then as they get better, uh, the refinement comes from using the content. And I wish, I I know there's privacy concerns, but I wish um, YouTube explored the space, which is sort of putting a camera on the users if they allowed it, right, to study (laughs) their, uh, like I, I did a lot of emotion recognition work and so on uh, to study actual sort of richer signal. Uh, one of the cool things when you upload 360 like VR video to YouTube, and I've done this a few times. So I've, I've uploaded myself, it's a horrible idea. Uh, some people enjoyed it, but whatever. The video of me giving a lecture in, in 360 of the 360 camera. And it's cool because YouTube allows you to then watch wh- where did people look at? There's a heat map of where, you know, of where the center of the VR experience was. And it's interesting because that reveals to you like what people looked at. And it's, it's, very, it's not always what you were expecting. It's not in the case of the lecture is pretty boring. It is what we're expecting, but we did a few funny videos where there's a bunch of people doing things, and they yeah everybody tracks those people. You know, in the beginning they all look at the main person and they start spreading around and looking at the other people. It's fascinating. So that kind of that's a really strong signal of what people found exciting in the video. I don't know how you get that from people just watching, except they tuned out at this point. Like it's hard to measure 
this moment was super exciting for people. I don't know how you get that signal. Maybe comment. Is there a way to get that signal where this was like, this is when their eyes opened up and they're like, <laughs> like for me with the Ray Dalio video, right? Like at first I was like, oh, okay, this is another one of these like dumb it down for you videos. And then you like start watching. It's like, okay, there's really crisp, clean, deep explanation of how the economy works. That's where I like set up and started watching, right? That moment, is there a way to detect that moment? The only way I can think of is by asking people to Just ask. label it. Yeah. You mentioned that we're quite far away in terms of doing video analysis, deep video analysis. Of course, Google, YouTube, you know, uh, we're quite far away from solving the autonomous driving problem too. So it's- uh, <laughs> I don't know, I think we're closer to that. Well, uh, the the- <laughs> You know, you never know. And uh, the Wright brothers thought they're never, they're not gonna fly for 50 years, three years before they flew. So uh, what are the biggest challenges would you say? Is it the broad challenge of understanding video, understanding natural language, understanding the, the, the challenge before the entire machine learning community of just being able to understand data? Or is there something specific to video that's even more challenging than understanding natural language understanding. What's your sense of what the biggest challenge is? I mean, video are? is just so much information. Mm -hmm. And so precision becomes a real problem. It's like a, you know, you're, you're trying to classify something and you've got a million classes and you, the distinctions among them, at least from a, from a machine learning perspective are often pretty small, right? Like, um, uh, you know, you need to see this person's number in order to know which player it is. Mm -hmm. And, and there's a lot of players, um, or you need to see, uh, you know, the, the, the logo on their chest in order to know like which, which team they play for. And so, um, and that's just figuring out who's who, right. And then you go further and saying, okay, well, you know, was that a goal? Was it not a goal? Like, is that an interesting moment, as you said, or is that not an interesting moment? Um, these things can be pretty hard. So, okay, so Jan LeCun, I'm not sure if you're familiar sort of with his current thinking and work. So he, he believes that self, what he's referring to as self-supervised learning will be the solution sort of to achieving this kind of greater level of intelligence. In fact, the thing he's focusing on is watching video and predicting the next frame. So predicting the future of video, right? <laughs> uh, so for now, we're very far from that, but his thought is because it's unsupervised, uh -huh. or as he refers to as self-supervised, you know, if you watch enough video, essentially, if you watch YouTube, you'll be able to learn about the nature of reality, the physics, the common sense reasoning required by just teaching a system to predict the next frame. So he's confident yeah. this is the way to go. So for so you, from the perspective of just working with this video, how do you think an algorithm that just watches all of YouTube, stays up all day and night watching <laughs> YouTube, would be able to understand enough of the physics of the world about the way this world works, be able to do common sense reasoning and so on? Um, well, I mean, we have systems that already watch all the videos on YouTube, right? But they're just looking for very specific things, right? They're um, supervised learning systems that are trying to identify something or classify something. Um, and but, I don't know if I don't know if predicting the next frame is really going to get there because uh, I don't. I'm not an expert on compression algorithms, but I understand that that's kind of what compression video compression algorithms do is they basically try to predict the next frame and and um, and then fix up the places where they got it wrong. Uh, and that leads to higher compression than if you actually put all the bits for the next frame there. So so I, I don't know if I believe that just being able to predict the next frame uh, is going to be enough because, because there's so many frames and even a tiny bit of error on a per frame basis can lead to wildly different videos. So the thing is, the idea of compression is uh, one way to do compression is to describe through text what's contained in the video. That's the ultimate high level of compression. So the idea is uh, traditionally when you think of video or image compression, you, you're trying to maintain the same visual quality while reducing the size. But if you think of deep learning from a bigger perspective of what compression is, is you're trying to summarize the video. 
And the idea there is if you have a big enough neural network, this by watching the next, but trying to predict the next frame, you'll be able to form a compression of actually understanding what's going on in the scene. If there's two people talking, you can just reduce that entire video in the, into the fact that two people are talking and maybe the content of what they're saying and so on. That That's kind of the, the open-ended <laughs> dream. So uh, I just wanted to sort of express that because it's an interesting, compelling notion, but uh, it, it is nevertheless true that video, our world is a lot more complicated than we get well, credit for. I mean, in terms of search and discovery, we have been working on trying to summarize videos in text or or with some kind of labels for eight years at least and uh you know, and uh, we're kind of so 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 <laughs> and so, so <laughs> if you were said it's the problem is 100 percent solved and eight years ago it was zero percent solved how f where are we on that timeline would you say yeah to summarize a video well uh maybe less than a quarter of the way so on that topic, what does YouTube look like 10, 20, 30 years from now? I mean, I think that YouTube is evolving to take the place of TV. Um, you know, I grew up as a kid in the 70s and I watched a tremendous amount of television. And uh, I feel sorry for my poor mom because uh, people told her at the time that it was gonna rot my brain and that she should kill her t television. Um, but anyway, I mean, I think that YouTube is, at least for my family, a, a better version of television, right? It's one that is on demand. It's uh, more tailored to the things that my kids uh, want to watch. And also they can find things that um, they would never have found on television. And so I think that, at least from just observing my own family, that's where we're headed is that people watch YouTube kind of in the same way that I watched television when I was younger. So from a search and discovery perspective, what do you, what are you excited about in the five, 10, 20, 30 years? Like what kind of things, and it's already really good. I think it's achieved a lot of, of course we don't know what's possible. <laughs> so it's uh, it's uh, the, the task of search of typing in the text or discovering new videos by the next recommendation. I personally am really happy with the experience. I continuously, I rarely watch a video that's not awesome from my own perspective. But what's what's else is possible? What are you excited about? Well, I think uh, introducing people to more of what's available on YouTube is um, not only very important to YouTube and to creators, but I think it, it will help uh, enrich people's lives because there's a lot that I'm still finding out is available on YouTube that I didn't even know. Um, I've been working YouTube eight years and it wasn't until last year that I learned that, uh, that I could watch USC football games from the 1970s. Oh, wow. Like I didn't even know that was possible until <laughs> last year and I've been working here quite some time. Yeah. So, how, you know, what was broken about, about that, that it took me seven years to learn that this stuff was already on YouTube even when I got here. Um, so I think there's a big opportunity there. And then, as I said before, uh, you know, we want to make sure that YouTube um, finds a way to ensure that it's acting responsibly with respect to society and enriching people's lives. So we want to take all of the great things that it does and make sure that we are eliminating the negative consequences that might happen. Um, and then lastly, if we could get to a point where all the videos people watch are the best ones they've ever watched, that would be outstanding too. Do you see in many senses becoming a window into the world <clears throat> for people? I mean, it's, especially with live video, you get to watch events. I mean, it's really, it's the way you experience a lot of the world that's out there is, is better than TV in many, many ways. So do you see it becoming more than just video? Do you see creators creating visual experiences and virtual worlds? So if I'm, I'm talking crazy now, but sort of virtual reality and entering that space, or is that at least for now totally outside what YouTube is thinking about? I mean, I think Google is thinking about virtual reality. Uh, I don't think about virtual reality too much. <laughs> um, uh, I know that we would want to make sure that YouTube is there 
when virtual reality becomes something or if virtual reality becomes something that a lot of people are interested in. Um, but I haven't seen it really uh, take off yet. <laughs> take off. Well, the the future is wide open. Christos, I've been really looking forward to this conversation. It's been a huge honor. Thank you for answering some of the more difficult questions I've asked. I'm really excited about what uh, YouTube has in store for us. It's one of the greatest products I've ever used and continues. So thank you so much for talking to me. It's really my pleasure. It. Thanks for asking me. Thanks for listening to this conversation. And thank you to our presenting sponsor, Cash App. Download it, use code LEXPODCAST. You'll get $10 and $10 will go to FIRST a STEM education nonprofit that inspires hundreds of thousands of young minds to become future leaders and innovators. If you enjoy this podcast, subscribe on YouTube, give it five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, support it on Patreon, or simply connect with me on Twitter. And now, let me leave you with some words of wisdom from Marcel Proust. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.